Hello, any future Submariners. This is Riley Robinson, Chief Director and Engineer of All Non-Essential Functions on board the Aurora. I'm making this recording for posterity. I'm the sole survivor of the Aurora Expedition and Degassi Survival Rescue, or attempt thereof. All the information of what has happened to us has been stored in my PDA. In truth, I've come across a lot of strange things on this world, and so I make this recording so that if anyone finds any of the strange things that I have, or happens to find any of the things that I've built, they might know why. And they may know why I never returned. What you're looking at here, and what should still be standing for a long time to come, is the Borealis. A specially designed escape rocket that Altera sent me the blueprints for, with the intention of having me use it to take advantage of several phase gates and return home. I did construct it with this intention. But after finishing it, priming it for takeoff, I have elected to stay. Should a reason, an urgent reason, to flee this planet arise, I will use it to leave. Not uh, Such a reason has not come up, however. What shot down the Aurora was a large weapon on an island called the Quarantine Enforcement Platform by those who built it. This weapon was designed to quarantine the planet because of an extremely dangerous bacteria known as the Cara Bacterium, which I have managed to find a cure for. Welcome aboard, Captain. I was afflicted by it. I am not any longer, and in time, nothing on the planet should be. This is the base that I've constructed while here. Much of it's quite modest, but I'm only one man, and don't need much. This likely doesn't need much explanation. It's simply a storage room of the many materials that I've used or needed while here. And this is my lab, where I did, essentially, all the work that actually needed to be done. A scanner room was constructed, and likely should still function, if not found, a million years after this, as this place is powered by four independent and very long-lasting power sources. I have a large supply of batteries standing by for use in any emergencies. Any of my equipment, if located, is powered by ion battery technology I developed here on the planet, as are two of the vehicles that I've constructed. This room is my personal quarters, designed to be able to give some leisure and relaxation amidst this chaotic planet. My PDA advised me against the construction of this room. I find something emotionally therapeutic about being able to look around in safety and see the world around me. That is my Cyclops, the Grandiose. It hasn't seen much use. Initially, I constructed it because I wasn't sure if I would ever need it, and I had the resources to do so. I did need its fabricator in order to construct the Borealis. It alone was able to produce one of the necessary components. However, it's designed to be run by a three-person crew. I'm one man, and frankly, I think it would cause more trouble than anything else. Had I no other options, I would use it liberally. But, I do have other options. Here are the Prawn Suit and Seamoth that have been with me my entire journey here. The Seamoth is KK, the Prawn Suit is Phineas. Both of them are powered by ion power cells and have been extensively upgraded. 
the Seamoth specifically, has gotten me through almost every difficulty that I've had on this planet. I built it within the first few hours of awakening after the crash, and it's been loyally by my side for the entire time. The bronze suit I built when depth required it. This is the cafeteria I constructed. Force of habit, I suppose. There was a cafeteria essentially everywhere I've ever been in my life. After constructing it, I realized how rather pointless it was, which is why I built only one table. I found the blueprints for a water filtration machine and constructed one. It consumes a shocking amount of power, but in exchange for salt and water whenever is necessary, I'd say it's worth it. Behind the cafeteria, I've constructed an alien containment. The fish inside are called Reginalds. They contain the highest caloric value of essentially any food that's on this planet. This makes them extremely valuable when needed, although frankly, not as convenient as this room. I acquired these plants from the small bit of dry land that is on this planet. Three of them, well, they came from a, a floating island that the Degassi survivors had sought refuge on. The lantern tree has been my personal favorite. Its abundance of food and lack of maintenance means I can simply enter and take food whenever I desire with no need to replant. It simply replaces itself, despite its lack of caloric or water value. The bulbo tree is another native species. Um, slicing off parts of it and eating them proved very, very effective. It's not clear whether the marble melons are native or were genetically engineered by the Degassi survivors, but I know that the potatoes were not native. Regardless, I found both being grown in their base when I found it, along with the rest of these strange plants that grew only on the dry land here. I decided to take samples of all of them and grow a few here in my base. The plants make it seem a bit more cathartic. Heavy reinforcement was required down this zone. I elected to perform a, a rather large project. Before we get to it, however, I should probably display what it is that keeps this place running. This is the nuclear reactor. It's currently being powered by four nuclear rods. One extra one has still remained in storage. I've used a significant amount of power, and not a single rod has been depleted. I doubt I'll have to use that much more again. The nuclear waste disposal t uh, tank is right nearby, and while it's pretty heavily shielded, and is likely no threat, I have repurposed all of the lead gear that I used against the Aurora's radiation when I fixed it to act as extra security in case something goes wrong with the nuclear reactor. Nothing has, but it pays to be safe. This has been my most loyal source of power, the biomass generator. One of the native species here, known as an oculus, which I keep in containment nearby, has an extremely high conversion rate of organic material into power. The trade-off is very worth it, because it takes up almost no space. This bioreactor hasn't even come close to running out of fuel for as long as I've had the containment built behind it. Further down, I have installed alien containments, 27 of them to be exact, for the purpose of holding and studying every alien creature that I could get my hands on. The peepers are particularly interesting. One of them, which can be seen by the strange lightly colored trail that it leaves, has been Infected? Afflicted? I'm not sure how to put it. Essentially, it carries an enzyme known as Enzyme 42, the cure for the bacterium that would have killed everything on this planet. These peepers have been keeping this entire ecosystem alive, having transported the enzyme all over the crater that everything here lives within. The bladderfish were a potential source of oxygen and water. I never really took advantage of it, never saw a reason to. I got significantly more water out of simply bleaching it. They are fascinating, however. The 
boomerangs were one of the most baffling creatures that I came across. I'm still not sure how an animal like this exists, and exists in large numbers. These things can be found just about everywhere on this planet. The hoverfish seemed to live only within particular biomes that I found, known as the kelp forests. These things don't seem to venture very far outside, although I have seen some of them out a bit. They generally act as simple prey for the predatory species that also live within the kelp forest. The spadefish are extremely abundant in the further out sections of this planet, particularly on large grassy plateaus. They're the largest of the small fish I was able to capture by hand, and have caused untold amounts of damage to my sea moth while piloting it. The hoopfish is another strange fish that also lives within the kelp forests, seemingly in nowhere else. They're a lot faster than the hoverfish and seem more capable, but both only seem to feed on creep vines instead of anything else. The whole fish is an extreme is the smallest of the the fish that I recovered. Also a strange design, but they oftentimes didn't need to move very quickly. They can turn fast, but they seemed to live underground more than anywhere else. Finding them was a bit frustrating. Their small size and lack of open water travel made them difficult to find. Of course, I've already shown the Reginalds. I have an extra containment of them, as well as the Oculus, despite having the more purpose-built ones. This here is the Gary Fish. It's one of the few creatures that made me laugh the first time I saw it. I'm still not sure why it looks that way. This is the Eye Eye. Also one of the most abundant fish, particularly the further and deeper that you go to the planet. It has some of the highest water concentration of any of the animals here. Not much caloric value, however. And I'm still not sure how a creature like this has survived for this long. But it has survived, and in fact has thrived. This is the Oculus. I've already shown it a variation of the peepers that live within a single cave system on the planet. Fascinating specimens. Here we have the spinefish, a rather unsettling fish that dwells in some of the more terrifying regions of this planet. They prefer to live mostly around this blood kelp that grows in massive fields at lowly lit, deep environments of the planet, often inhabited by extremely hostile and rather spooky creatures. The cuttlefish are one of the strangest, if not the single strangest thing that i found here. Despite all the aliens I've located, and everything else that I've seen on this world, these creatures I hatched from five eggs that I found in specific locations around this planet. They'd been in stasis like most of the eggs here. These ones were different, and I'm not sure how or why. Regardless, they seem rather kind, very intelligent, and quite playful. I set one of them free, out to the open waters, and it swam away in rather short order. It'll likely survive for quite a while. The tentacles would make them very difficult to catch, and I'm not particularly close to any large creatures. These are the Mesmers. Despite how unthreatening they might look, they are a very predatory species. More than one of them has attempted to lure me in with hypnotic lights in order to get a chunk of me, like most of the creatures here want. It even seems to have adverse effects on the PDA. The crash fish seems to live within a plant found inside of caves. It generates sulfur, almost. The crash fish seems to absorb a lot of this and detonate upon a high enough impact point. This has been used against me many times while exploring caves around the shallower waters. They are predatory species, but if one has a simple degree of speed, they're not that difficult to outmaneuver. The gasopods are a rather not quite endangered, but not as high a population as you might expect for their size. 
They're, they're a band of herbivores, mostly dwelling only in very shallow waters, and I've only come across a couple groups of them. Their tails look strange, and that's because they're designed to emit a large amount of gas pellets that attempt to kill whoever they touch. They've been frustrating for me in the past. The rabbit rays were an extremely calm and pleasant species that I came across in shallower waters. A variation of many rays that I have found on this planet. Completely harmless, very simple to deal with, and they've never posed any sort of threat at all. That said, they are one of my favorite creatures to look at. Here we have the sand shark, one of the most prevalent predatory species on the planet. They generally dwell in, well, areas of high sand, where they bury themselves under the sand and jump out at those who would try to attack them. Uh, they've been more a source of amusement than a danger, as long as I've been here. And these are the stalkers, the predatory species of the kelp forests. Their long snouts, thin bodies, and large teeth have made them one of the most streamlined predators on the planet. They have been rather dangerous or frustrating. Their bites weren't able to pierce the suit that I wear too quickly, although given a little time, they certainly would. Their teeth was essential in some of the advanced fabrications that got me through this place. The jelly ray are one of the only kinder species at lower depths. They are very, very harmless, and that makes them a source of food for essentially every predator that dwells so deep. Predators like these, the bone sharks, the most prevalent predatory species on the planet. These creatures have been a nightmare for as long as I've been here. There's probably not a single one on the planet that hasn't tried to take a bite out of me or my sea moth at some point. Simple lights in the eyes or a slash or electric jolt seems to generally drive them away, though. The crab snakes dwell in the same cave system as the oculus, and it's the only place they're found on the planet. They're capable of outputting some pretty serious damage and rather unnerving to look at. They have some sort of symbiotic relationship with the mushrooms. The crab snakes generally dwell inside of them, but only when both are much larger. I had to go straight inside of the mushrooms that they inhabited just to find their eggs. These here are the ampules, the only animal on the planet I'm aware of that generates electric charge on a regular basis. These things were dangerous whether they wanted to be or not. Fortunately, they were easy to evade, as long as you kept your lights off. They are one of the more predatory species at deeper depths, uh, but they were never quite a threat to me. These are one of the most terrifying creatures I encountered on this world. I still debate completely destroying this alien containment and killing them all, but they seem calm enough inside. These things have been known to emit a very high frequency EM pulse that disables all nearby electronics, or at least large electronics, for a few seconds. The only time they actually caught one of my vehicles with it, I had a stasis rifle and a thermo knife and was able to fend it off, although it was rather terrifying. The lava lizard is a creature I found only in the lava pl zones of the planet, areas of high volcanic activity that have lava running through them pretty regularly. This thing can miraculously enough survive inside the lava itself, it would cover itself in the rock to make itself more resilient before spitting the magma at me. They were one of the most frustrating creatures, as a slash from a knife or an electric jolt would not drive them away. This is the magma ring. It looks a lot like the boomerang, but it dwells at a much, much deeper depth, down in the lava zones, over 1400 meters down. They are a strange creature. I like their coloration even if they are rather pointless. The red eye, eye is essentially just a, the same thing as the magma ring, but for the eye, eye, it also dwells in the lava zones and has almost exactly similar stats to the regular eye, eye. Just, it's red. That's all 27 of the alien containments. Those were the only creatures I was able to procure, though there are many more on this planet. This entire recording may be pointless. All of this information is already on my PDA, and I've done my best to locate and log every single wreck 
that split off from the Aurora in re-entry, every single Degassi base, and every piece of alien technology on the planet I could, compiling all the information and data onto my PDA. If anyone finds my PDA intact, they would have access to everything that I do. Now, for the real reason that no one would find me. I built this rocket so that I could leave this world. When I first landed, it seemed only hostile, violent. Everything was trying to kill me. That hasn't really changed. Well, not very much. The biological constructs on this planet, the warpers, they are no longer trying to kill me. But they're the only ones. But I found out how to survive here, and I've discovered something else. Something I never had at Altera. Freedom. Altera has programmed into the PDA a reminder, pretty regularly while I was exploring the planet, that everything I found I would have to pay back. My balance stands in the billions at least. I have no intention of paying back the things I needed to survive. And I had no real life there in Altera anyway. Time capsule ready. As I've said before, if there's ever an emergency that requires me to leave as soon as possible, the rocket is prepared. But I doubt there will be. I've dealt with the emergency. And Altera has expressed no ooh, no interest and coming back out here. That's why they sent me the blueprints for this rocket. I don't expect to see them again. They may get out here, likely after my lifetime. Or they may never see this planet. Which would be a shame, because it's beautiful. I've realized that freedom is the most important thing. That even living here alone, and having to struggle just to survive, is better than being a, essentially, slave to that organization. I have everything I need here. With my power generation, powered by more than just the therm than th just the nuclear and the bioreactor, I've installed a thermal generator here at a volcanic vent in the shallower waters, and several solar panels, and I could build more if ever the need arises, though I doubt it will. I have everything I need here to survive for the rest of my lifetime rather comfortably. This place isn't quite as furnished as it could be, but I can change that with time. Welcome aboard, I've dealt with the immediate threat. The bacteria's gone. I've saved this planet and myself. And I don't intend to ever leave. Because here I'm free. That said, I did disable the weapon that fires at any ships in orbit. Because I lost friends on board that ship. I watched it destroy the sunbeam with my own eyes generous men, who were here to rescue me. All dead now. Despite how much I value my freedom, and have come to enjoy the solitude, I don't wish to see anyone else harmed. So if someone else finds your way here, I'd welcome them. But I will not leave. Not now. I think I've accomplished everything I intended to with this recording. This is Riley Robinson, signing off.